Christ. someone, just remind them of how God has saved them if they have trusted in Jesus Christ. Remind them of the old, old story. Hymn number 431 is not one we will sing, but we will listen to it being played. Number 431 is our meditation hymn. It's called A Servant's Heart. If you would like to turn to that. The refrain on this says, Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Here's my life. Take every part. Help me draw so close to you that your love comes shining through in spite of all our circumstances. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart.
going to preach after that. Go, son. Special combination of message, beautiful message in that piece, combined with many pleasant memories around the piano. I'd like to take our Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17, I'm going to read from verses from verse 8 down through verse 16, and I would invite you, if you are able, in honor of God's word, to stand with me as I read this text. Exodus chapter 17, beginning with verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in the Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands on one, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book, and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is My Banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we again come to you this time in response to the reading of your word and pray that you will guide our minds and our hearts as we seek to understand what your word has for us today. Pray for clarity of expression as I share with your people that which you have laid upon my heart today. May they hear from you today, and may they commit themselves ever the more to be following you directly and carefully. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Wednesday night, I began to share a, a concern that I had with the prayer meeting folks who were here, and I made mention of something called a generational trauma, and I have since understood that that is actually very common, though I don't really understand fully where it comes from. In fact, I had never even heard of the consideration of generational trauma until I read this article this past week, and that kind of gives a very good positive testimony to the loving family that I grew up in. I don't believe there was any trauma passed on to my generation from my former generation, although I can't imagine that everybody can say that. And as I, was go as I was reading through this article, it was more specifically not just on generational trauma, 
but how to break the cycle. The example that they were giving was, of course, in the most recent news, those of the Palestinians being displaced from Gaza today. You know, some of those who are being displaced are mothers, some with child, and as they bear their children and those children grow up in an environment in which through no fault of their own, they are constantly learning what a day-to-day -day average normal daily life will be for them. And it's far different from what any of us have ever experienced, I would venture to say. Palestinians being displaced from Gaza has incurred some who are not in the Gaza area, but who live in the United States and other areas around the world to have stood up and to declare and to protest and to say that Israel should be letting Gaza alone. Now, I'm not going to take sides on a political debate, but I want to use this opportunity to recognize two different options. When one is embracing the concept of trauma being passed down from your circumstances, from parents and from grandparents, either that trauma gives fuel for the fire, which is what is firing off a lot of protests, or it gives opportunity to break the cycle. Now, whether it's Palestinians being displaced from Gaza, or whether it's the Jews in the Holocaust, or whether it's native communities, even in our own country, who have had to face colonization and the taking aside of their children into boarding schools, and those children growing up and having children of their own and telling them what life has been like and what life they have to stand up for. You know, they still have issues today. What about the black versus white community issues? Are there not still battles being fought today or has that all been settled? What about the North versus South? There are so many different circumstances in which a child born today continues to learn their past, their, their past history, learning their grandparents and their great-grandparents and those going before them. And the teaching is either don't let it die, one day will make things right. Or, what is the alternative? Is it possible to forgive, to open up dialogue, and to be able to somehow break the cycle of the generational trauma that keeps getting passed on from one generation to another? Parents keep alive their own unprocessed trauma by passing it on to their children until one generation doesn't know why they are still fighting. Yeah. There has even been scientific support showing children of trauma sufferers born with lower <coughs> levels of cortisol, which I am told is what is primary in aiding in responding to stress. How the world deals with racism and hatred and other fuels of the fire. Focus on fixing self. Dealing with anxiety, with open dialogue and, and teaching children. But somehow being able to teach our children without passing on that generational trauma. You know what it means.
things to you got to watch out how different types of people treat us. We have evidence that being of a different race means that you're going to be treated differently when you walk into the Social Security office or when you walk into the hospital. Don't we have all that settled? That's all a thing of the past, isn't it? How do we settle? If, if active listening and learning and toleration and setting aside hatred, if that works, then how is it that the world is supposed to be a better place? Is it really? Has it worked? And I would suggest to you that I have come to a, a conclusion of my, in my own mind that there is an innate sense of justice in every one of us. I believe God has designed into every human being an innate sense of justice. And justice demands that the fight goes on until justice has been served. Without God, man is left to satisfy his own justice. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> and that is why we cannot see a solution without including a worldview that includes the creator of this universe. Amen. Satisfaction of justice is the only solution. And with that, there is two aspects that I would like to address from the scriptures. That is the, act, the, the concept of remembrance and the concept of vengeance. Vengeance is going to become key. And lest you judge my message before I get finished, I'm warning you, it's not going to turn out the way it initially comes out when I start mentioning the word vengeance. Exodus 17, we just read, Amalek was judged with what I'm going to call a generational consequence of their, of their fighting against Israel. In Exodus 17, verse 16, because the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The Amalekites are going to raise their children, telling them and remembering and recalling to them and teaching them that they are enemies of Israel's God. Not enemies of Israel necessarily. They're enemies of Israel's God. And that is going to be a trauma that is going to continue designed by God into the Amalekites. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Let me turn to that. 1 Samuel chapter 15 has a communication between Samuel and Saul. I didn't get my bookmarks into place. 1 Samuel chapter 15 starts out this way. Samuel said to Saul... The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now, Go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And here's where I get a link to this consideration of generational trauma. Why is, why are all of the the children and the infants being judged as well. 
I can't answer why God took all of these even innocent young children. And yet, from what we understand of what we've read about in generational trauma, even these young children, before having been taught anything, are already at a disadvantage with the lower cortisol levels because of the trauma that's been passed down to them. I don't know if that figures into why God does these things, why God did this this way to Amalek. But I do know this. God remembered Amalek's sin. And God remembered that sin not to go unpunished. Justice must be satisfied. I'd also like to note this statement that God's punishment is always just against sin. When Amalek turned against the Israelites and fought against them, the basically fighting against Israel's God, God remembered Amalek, demanded justice be satisfied, and we recognize God's punishment is always just. Now I'd like to turn back to Exodus chapter 20. Do you remember from any of your memorizations of the past what we find in Exodus chapter 20? The first commandment that God gave to Moses after declaring, I am the Lord your God, brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, God said, ye shall have no other gods before me. I'd like to look at the second commandment that God gave to Moses. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. Why is it that God is giving them this? Because God says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those that hate me. Does that sound like generational trauma? No. But the rest of that commandment includes verse 6. It says, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. I'd like to look closely at this law. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Judgment of sin does affect subsequent generations. Judgment of sin can affect generations of people. According to verse 5. But in contrast to that, mercy, mercy affects individuals independently. There is mercy in this world. God has designed mercy into this world just as much as God has designed generational trauma. But mercy is an interesting feature of God's design because somehow mercy raises the question of, you know, if, if I extend mercy, then how is justice going to be satisfied? And of course, by now you're starting to catch on in the direction of this message. Justice involves remembrance and vengeance. I'll make that statement again. Justice involves both remembrance and vengeance. Now, contrary to Martin Luther King's ideal and that with which the world has no mechanism to deal with, Martin Luther King had the ideal of a world peace based on nonviolence and a number of other things. 
But this concept of vengeance, which is contrary to Martin Luther King, vengeance also is something that the world doesn't really know how to deal with because as soon as you start talking about vengeance, you're talking about deciding and justifying that somebody needs to be punished. Mercy, on the other hand, allows punishment to be overlooked. But how then does mercy satisfy justice? Mercy and forgiveness are two concepts that are very difficult for the world to talk about because the world is trying to eliminate such things as righteous judgments. The world is trying to eliminate the concept of sin. But look at the word mercy for just a moment. Mercy implies that somehow there was a punishment deserved, or else mercy would not be mercy. A punishment deserved implies that there was a violation of something in order to be punished. A violation implies that there must be a law. The law implies that there's, teaches us that there is sin, and these are the things that the world is trying to erase. Look at the word forgiveness for just a moment. Similar to the word mercy. Forgiveness implies some act of wrong to be forgiven. Which means somebody did something wrong, that means there's been a violation, which means there's some kind of a law to decide what is right and wrong. And that law is what gives us the knowledge of sin. And that's what the world is trying to stomp out. But now let me give you what I believe is God's answer from the Word of God. Forgiveness, which doesn't work for a Christless world because it doesn't satisfy justice. Forgiveness does not satisfy justice. But vengeance, on the other hand, which satisfies justice, but doesn't deal appropriately with seeking world peace. And even the very concept of satisfying justice begs the question of whose justice are you going to satisfy? I have some verses that I'd like to read, starting with Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. There's another verse in Psalm 78 uh, referring to Israel's repeated rebellion, but he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. You've been through the Old Testament, I'm sure, at least once. You may recognize how many times Israel 
rejected their God and turned after other gods of the nations around them. And time and time again, the Lord sent judges and saviors and kings to rescue them from their situations. Matthew 18 tells us that the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Do you remember the context of Matthew 18? Where the, the, the one who owed his master a large debt pleaded for mercy and the master simply forgave him. But then he went out and found another one of his own servants who owed him just a very little and treated him shamefully that he should be paid back. And so when we get down to Matthew 18, verse 32, then this master's Lord, after he had called him back again, said to him, Thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because you desired it of me. Should you not also have forgiven your fellow servant? Forgiveness is powerful. Second Corinthians 2 verse 10 says, To whom ye forgive anything, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he says, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. And then by instruction in Colossians 3.13, we are instructed forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Okay, so we get it on the forgiveness concept. Forgiveness allows us to have that peace with God, our Creator, and even a a sense of peace with our fellow man and starts to set aside the fuel for the fire. But what about having freed the person of anxiety and hatred? What about this concept of vengeance? For that, I would like to take us to a couple, of, a couple more verses, beginning with Romans 12 and verse 19. This is where we see how the world doesn't work this way because we have to address God in order to find that satisfaction of justice through vengeance. Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. That's part of the key. That's one of the, the cylinders on the key that has to be lined up just right. There's other cylinders on the key, but this one has to be lined up just right. It's called avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Yes, there is place for wrath. There is place for vengeance. But God is telling us through Romans chapter 12. It is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Second Thessalonians, I'd like to turn to that one. There's a few verses to pick up there as well. Second Thessalonians, that's after Corinthians, thank you. Second Thessalonians, chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, Let's stop right there for just a second and make sure we get the context. God will repay tribulation to those who trouble his people. When is that going to take place? When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not the rapture. This is after 
the rapture. This is after the tribulation period, and there is this concept of God's vengeance being taken. We see it at the Battle of Armageddon, when God, when the Lord Jesus comes down with, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those. These, verse 9, shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Hebrews 10 verse 30 reminds us again that we know him that has said, vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. That's an interesting statement. We are going to face a, an evaluation of how we have responded to God's word as the Lord is taking vengeance upon the evil. He is also going to judge his people. And so I leave you with this. Forgiveness frees a person of the anxiety and hatred. For it has that potential. Vengeance leaves in God's hand to satisfy justice. And that is where we get a satisfaction to know that those who are treating us evil will one day have their vengeance from God as God determines. As we recognize with the psalmist how he could not understand how the evil in this world continues to prosper until he went into the temple of the Lord and considered their end. So how to become one of what Psalm 32 described? Of those who believe in him? Psalm 32, I had one more reference. We read verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Then we include verse 5. When I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity have I not hidden, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. That is the answer to our being one of those blessed whose transgression is forgiven. We must acknowledge our sin before the Lord. We must believe, as John 3.16 tells us, that whosoever believes in Jesus Christ, as he was raised up on the cross, shall not perish in God's vengeance, but will have God's mercy, eternal life. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, gives us the response that if, we sh that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Where do you sit this morning? Have you acknowledged your sin before God? Have you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, knowing that he took your sin upon the cross so that you could have God's mercy instead of God's vengeance? And have you confessed your belief in Jesus Christ unto salvation? If this leaves you with any questions, I would encourage you to contact me whatever way you can. If you're listening by way of our YouTube channel, welcome. And uh, you can contact us through our web 
through our website, augustabaptist.org. Contact me in some way or another, and let's answer these questions for you. In the meantime, if we have concerns of our own, if the Holy Spirit has laid on your heart something that needs to take place in order to help you to free yourself from the anxiety and hatred of your own past, forgiveness is the key there. And when we want to be satisfied to know that justice will be served, God is going to take care of that. But then I ask you another question. How can you demand that God's justice be served on this certain individual who is so evil without recognizing that perhaps at one time you yourself were equally condemned but for God's mercy? Yes, justice will be satisfied. Forgiveness is the key to relieving the anxiety and hatred. But mercy also extends the opportunity for a fellow human being to be saved as we were. Pray that the Lord would be merciful to and would save those who have caused us such great trauma. Amen. Let us pray. God in heaven, I pray that you will help me. As I seek to understand and to encourage others, help me to recognize the same needs, to forgive, and to be merciful. And we leave in your hands, O oh God, to rightly and justly satisfy your justice in time, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's turn in our hymn book to number 340. Number 340 gives us the subject, Christ receives sinful men. Rather than simply demanding God's justice, let God do the demanding. Let us recognize that God still receives sinful men and can change them into a trophy of God's grace. Number 340, we're going to sing just the first verse. Let's stand together. <laughs> as well as he has redeemed your own. 